Now in this final video on the angiosperm life cycle, which we'll entitle angiosperm uh, 6, I believe that's where we're up to, we're going to finally complete and conclude the life cycle. Okay, so this will be subtitled the life cycle conclusion. Life cycle conclusion. Okay, so where did we leave off prior? Prior we established the idea of pollination. We have a pollen tube. Pollen tube grows, grows through the style, towards the ovary, through the micropyle, into the ovule uh, section that has going to house the female gametophyte. Two sperm are discharged onto this pollen tube highway to get there. What's next? What's next is something termed double fertilization. And this is a critically important, uh, a critically differentiating process that our angiosperms will undergo. So in double fertilization, I want to make sure this is clear, this is absolutely only happening in angios. It's only in angiosperms. And that's why we have this double fertilization mentioned for the first time in, in our entire Biology 115 and 116 story. So what is double, double fertilization? Here we're going to have one sperm that fertilizes the egg. Okay, so this is going to be uh, something that we know of, that was something that we've seen before, and this is sort of a story that we know the ending to. One sperm fertilizes egg. When that sperm fertilizes this egg, we're going to create a diploid zygote. Same story that we're very quite familiar with. On the other side of the story, we're going to have something known as the second sperm cell, because remember, two sperm cells were discharged. So what's going to happen with the second one? The second sperm is going to fuse with the two nuclei, going to fuse with the two nuclei in that central cell. Because remember, we said one thing is going to turn into that egg cell. So I said one of them is going to be an egg cell. That one egg cell is going to be uh, part of this double fertilization on this side of the story. Then the other part of that structure, which was the central cell, is going to be involved in this part of the story. The second sperm is going to fuse with the two nuclei in that central cell. That's going to result in something known as a triploid cell. So this is the first time we see something like this, a triploid cell and a diploid zygote. So what does this all mean in the overall grand scheme of the angiosperm? So this is essentially what double fertilization is. This side and this side happen simultaneously. Now what is the purpose of this? Now what we have to understand is directly after a double fertilization event, so after double F-E-R-T for fertilization, the ovule which is the surrounding structure where all of this is happening, the ovule matures into a seed. Now, remember, the idea of angiosperms is the fact that these are covered seeds. These are plants that are going to produce seed structures that are important in the overall success of the angiosperms on their sort of capabilities as land plants. So, let's see this story. The zygote Let's talk about the zygote. What happens after this idea of fertilization producing a seed? The zygote is going to develop into a sporophyte. Why a sporophyte? Well, that's because it's diploid. And the sporophyte structure that's eventually going to develop from this plant that once was a sporophyte, both the parent, the male side, and the female side, that's going to eventually reintroduce itself. The zygote develops into a sporophyte just like we expect because the sporophyte is the dominant stage of our angiosperm life cycles. So that's our sporophyte story on the zygote side. Now what about this weird triploid cell? This weird triploid cell will be involved in a critically important process, and that's going to be developing into something known as the endosperm. So it develops into a structure called the endosperm. So triploid cell develops into endosperm. Remember where the triploid cell comes from, the second sperm fusing with the central cell that had two nuclei, thus we have triploid. So two nuclei, so haploid, haploid, plus another haploid gives us triploid, right? So it develops into the endosperm. So the ultimate consequence of this sporophyte structure, um, what we have to remember is that this is going to also possess a rudimentary root. So this small, tiny growing seed, this sporophyte that's very small, very uh, immature, is going to have a rudimentary root structure that's going to be important in its eventual growth when it becomes a completely developed sporophyte. And it's going to have one or two structures called cotyledons. Okay? 
Kotli Dons, uh, as many people call them. These are essentially uh, what we call and refer to as seed leaves. Very visible when you look at a seed. They're actually pretty prominent when you look at, let's say, a peanut, both of which, the rudimentary root and the seed leaves. When you open up a peanut, you can actually see both of these. Um, do a basic Google image search of them. You can actually see both of them and how they look in a macro scale, such as the peanut. Okay. So what about the endosperm? What was the purpose of this triploid nonsense? Why do we have double fertilization? Why can't we just deal with this and continue life as an angiosperm? The endosperm side of the story is in critically important because this is going to be tissue, triploid tissue, that is rich in starch and other nutrients. So you should already be thinking, what is the purpose of this? Why would we need starch plus other nutrients for something that's already been fertilized? Well, that's because this is a seed. And this is going to be a critically important part that allows for nourishing. This starch structure, this nutrients that are found within the endosperm, the triploid cell uh, origination uh, of the endosperm, is what's going to nourish the developing embryo. Where is the developing embryo? The developing embryo is that initial first side of the double fertilization story. That zygote develops into a sporophyte. That is the developing embryo. That developing embryo needs the tissue that's rich in starch and other nutrients for it to do exactly what I just said, for it to develop. So that is our life cycle of angiosperms. It's a lot of information. I totally understand. Take a look at figure 30.12. This figure in your textbook summarizes all of the steps that we've done. There are about, in total, eight very generative, very summative steps that that figure gives us that really helps us get a summary of the life cycle of angiosperms. It's very complicated on the, uh, on the outset, at least, but once you look at that figure, go along with the notes with that figure, it'll make a lot more sense, and this is what ends up as our conclusion to the life cycle of angiosperms.